Robin Wright is a journalist, author, and foreign policy analyst. Uh, during her fellowship at the Wilson Center and USIP, she worked sim simultaneously on two books, Rock the Casbah and the Iran uh, Primer, Power Politics and U.S. Policy. You have a sample of the Primer outside, and you can uh, order it through USIP. Uh, Robin has reported for more than 140 countries on six continents, uh, has written for the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Sunday Times of London, CBS News, and the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, she has also written for the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, Time, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, the International Herald Tribune, the Atlantic, and many others, and uh, her last uh, article appeared in the Wilson Quarterly, which uh, we left some copies outside for you to take home uh, with you. In uh, Rock the Casbah, Robin Wright tells the personal stories behind the rejection of both autocrats and extremists in the Muslim world. She provides young techies, mobilizing political uprisings, cleric, publicly repudiating Osama bin Laden, Muslim comedians, ridiculing military, hip-hop artists, rapping against guns and bombs, playwrights and poets redefining jihad, feminists reinterpreting the Quran, and militants denouncing violence. Robin describes this new phase of Islamic activism as a counter-jihad. For its summer reading list, New York Magazine selected Rock the Casbah as a must read. The Huffington Post calls it as one of the most anticipated books of the summer. The Publisher Weekly says this book is an accessible and riveting account for readers looking to learn more about the post-9-11 Islamic world. Uh, the Wilson Center uh, TV program is going to air uh, next week, uh, next Wednesday, on MHC, a long interview on the book they did with uh, Robin. There is information on the desk you can pick it up on your way out. Before I give the floor to Robin, could I please ask you to close your cell phone, your Blackberries, I mean, no texting, please, because it interferes with our uh, live uh, webcast. Robin, you have the floor. And Robin has graciously accepted to sign the, her book afterward. I love to sign my books. Those are my babies. <laughs> Uh, I thank you all, first of all, for coming uh, and helping me celebrate the publication of my book. Uh, I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Holly, who very early uh, with uh, this book idea took me in and said, come to the Wilson Center. Mike Van Dusen made it uh, possible. They have been incredibly generous, thoughtful, helpful, uh, reading my manuscript, talking through ideas about what at times seem counterintuitive themes. And of course, I am particularly also grateful to Rob Litvak, who is here, um, because when a lot of us were struggling to come up with a title that would capture a lot of uh, different aspects of what I call the counter jihad, uh, Rob, off the top of his said, rock the Casbah. And I knew instantly that that was um, exactly the right title. What I want to do today is show you a lot of pictures of the, of the kinds of people I try to profile in my book uh, to de help define some of the ideas uh, that I talk about. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody, to, to, including the cameras, to, to focus on uh, my pictures, not me, for a few minutes. Um, the most important story, I think, in the early 21st century is the epic convulsion across the Islamic world. Uh, rage and rebellions against geriatric leaders is the greatest single wave of empowerment in the early 21st century uh, since the historic spurt that brought down communism in Eastern Europe and 
minority rule and, and apartheid in Africa and military dictatorships in Latin America. The Arab upheavals in Egypt, Tunisia, and beyond uh, now constitute one of the four major turning points of the past century, along with uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, the creation of Israel after World War II, and the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Each one has redefined the region in terms of its politics, its security, um, its alliances, and its relationship with the outside world. The new movements are also redefining who is empowered in the Middle East and the wider Islamic world. And the reason I showed you these pictures, which we've all seen kind of individually, is just to give you a sense of the scope of how big it is in each of these places. The unrest in, um, in Egypt and, be, uh, uh, and beyond erupted for several reasons, including the fact that two-thirds of the region's 300 million people are under the age of 30. Um, this is also the first generation where the majority are literate, moving beyond goals of daily subsistence. They actually have an idea about a future that um, uh, gets them beyond inheriting the profession of their father or, in the case of women, uh, just raising children or staying at home. <clears throat> and that's the other interesting trend, and that is that women are decisively a political force today, um, often despite regimes and despite men. <clears throat> People now have a voice. Uh, and they are willing to use it bluntly, whether through the old media or the new media. Um, after covering six wars in my professional life in the Middle East and two intifadas, the thing that struck me in going back for this book over the past two years has been uh, that in vastly diverse political systems, in military dictatorships and in monarchies, in homogenous societies as well as deeply sectarian countries, in modern states as well as in traditional tribal nations, in pitifully poor countries as well as in oil-rich shakedoms. The overwhelming desire by all of these people is to use civil disobedience, not violence. This is such a change in the world's most volatile corner of the world. What's also striking is the desperation of governments, which is also unprecedented. In openly bloodying its own people, as in Bahrain, and attacking peaceful encampments, again, as in Bahrain's Pearl Square. Um, this, this is Pearl Square, and, and the monument there is the landmark of Bahrain. It is the Eiffel Tower of Bahrain. And Bahrain went so far in quashing the revolts that it even took down the Pearl Monument, uh, a symbol that's on its most valuable coin, which is sure to come back and haunt them someday. Uh, two of these four presidents are now gone, and the other two have no chance now of surviving politically however long it takes. Uh, if I were a betting woman, my father bet on everything, but more, no more than a quarter. He was a law professor. Uh, I would bet 50 cents that both of these men are out by the end of the year. Um, all 22 Arab countries will be changed significantly over the next year and over the next decade by the rage and rebellions in the region. And all 22 leaders will have their powers changed in significant ways, even if the majority of the leaders manage to stay in power for now. For now. But the bold new challenges uh, that I write about in this book are also extended to extremists. Uh, the, the movement I write about is against uh, militancy as well as against autocracy. The common message of the uprisings, in fact, is the rejection of militancy. 
and this is what I call the counter jihad, uh, the post jihad phase. I think the next decade will be de defined by the counter jihad in the same way the past decade has been defined in a lot of different ways by 9-11. Uh, this is the final, uh, this was the, pi the picture on an audio message from Ayman al-Zawahiri, now the head of Al-Qaeda, that arrived about three weeks uh, after it was taped via cutouts and slow couriers, and it ended up on uh, an Arabic television station, uh, several in fact. It arrived after the ouster of Osama bin, or uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak, uh, but had clearly been made long before it. In the tape, Zawahiri railed against uh, democracy and rambled on about uh, Ottoman history. In an era of Facebook as the medium for communicating opposition and warp speed Twitter for reporting events on the ground, Al-Qaeda Al now seems really behind the curve in its message uh, and frankly conspicuously unplugged from the new realities. Another striking trend I write about, which I call the big chill, uh, is the decision by many of the clerics who were uh, once allied or role models for bin Laden or other militants who have turned on the extremists, on their theology as well as their tactics. Uh, Sheikh Salman was one of the early heroes of Osama bin Laden. And after he was, uh, he issued a, a fatwa during the Gulf War in 1990-91 against the United States for, or against, for the, against the Saudi regime for allowing infidel troops to occupy or um, deploy in Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Islam. After his arrest, that was the moment that bin Laden adopted the role of emir and began issuing his own fatwas and talked openly about um, that in the absence of Sheikh Salman that um, this was a role that he was inheriting. Sheikh Salman has since um, repudiated bin Laden and specifically on the anniversaries of 9-11, he has over the past three years come out in very vocal ways in condemning 9-11, uh, uh, the doctrine um, of Al-Qaeda, and its use of militancy. Uh, this is another one of the, the clerics who's again turned on bin Laden. Uh, Dr. Fadl, whose real name is Said Imam al-Sharif, um, merged forces with bin Laden in the late 1980s. He wrote the how-to book for al-Qaeda that justified extremism and its uh, targeting of anyone, of any religion, who disagreed with al-Qaeda. Um, his second book, which was over a thousand pages, has often been called the Das Kapital of al-Qaeda. Uh, but he fell out with uh, bin Laden and uh, in recent years, he's gone, he, was in, he, went, fled, he went to Yemen and then was, uh, after 9-11 was arrested. He's now in Egypt in a jail. But he has since put out a third book, which is most notable for condemning 9-11 specifically as a catastrophe and revising his writings on every aspect of what jihad is. What's very interesting is the emergence of a different kind of cleric. These are the new, what I write about as the YouTube imams and the satellite shakes. These are um, the young kind of street preachers who don't have the, the, uh, the scholarly training but have become popular clerics uh, with enormous audiences. There's another one in Egypt uh, who has more hits on his website uh, his name is Amr Khalid, than Oprah gets on hers. There's just enormous um, impact they have, enormous following. Now, um, Ayman uh, uh, Shigeri has a program called What Would He Have Done? And he, it's a, like a candid camera program on, and it's the most popular show on the largest uh, entertainment network among the satellite t television stations in the region. And he sets up situations, for example, a wallet on the ground and he will watch secretly taping what someone does with it. And then he will walk out and ask the person, 
what would he have done, meaning what would the prophet have done? And it's a way of trying to teach popularly what is goodness and what is the common decency um, in Islam. And it's a whole different message. And the, the generation of uh, street clerics, street preachers, is redefining uh, who the young listen to and the message they get. Um, another trend I write about is what I call the new martyrdom. Uh, in stark contrast to the suicide bombers who have defined uh, uh, the region for three decades, we're now seeing a new type of martyrdom. This is a picture of Mohammed Bouazizi, who is the young street vendor who last December, after a confrontation uh, and a demand for a bribe from a local uh, inspector, tried to get recourse when his produce was confiscated in his scale and the bribe was for a total of 10 dinars, seven bucks. But for someone, seven bucks is a lot of money. And so he uh, went to the, finally went to the governor's office, covered himself with gasoline, and set himself on fire. Uh, it's, he was not the first one to do it, but the protest, the family then turned around and went down to the governor's house later that day and threw money across the fence shouting, Here's your bribe, here's your bribe. And that protest was captured on YouTube video, on cell phone video and put, posted on Facebook and YouTube. And it was this convergence of incident with tools, with um, uh, Al Jazeera had started a media search through Facebook looking for interesting videos, pick this up. And so it was one of those um, moments when we all look at what started it all, it was all of these things coming together at the same time. Um, Bowie set, uh, Bouazizi set himself on fire, not to kill anyone else, but to shame a government. And he was far more effective in his results in producing change than any militant group, cell, or individual in the region. And it was this outrage in Tunisia that spread across the country and since across the region. Bouazizi tragically um, lingered for three weeks <clears throat> in the hospital. Uh, that's a visit by President Ben Ali in a desperate attempt to try to cling to power. Bouazizi died <clears throat> just days before uh, ben Ali fled. Um, and after Ben Ali left, thousands of Tunisians drove to the remote village where he lived to pay homage at his gravesite. And he is now honored on a national stamp. Uh, another one of the new martyrs is uh, Khalid Saeed, who's, uh, it's a very moving story about a young blogger who had evidence of police corruption and drug deals. He was at an international net cafe, two policemen came in, picked him up, took him outside, and started beating him. The last thing he was heard shouting was, you're killing me. And he did indeed die later that night um, in police custody. And I'll warn you that this is a brutal picture. This is the picture captured of him on a cell phone in the morgue. The regime tried to claim that he had died of a drug overdose. You can tell that's not a drug overdose. This picture made it onto the internet as well, and uh, led to a movement called We Are All Khalid Saeed. Uh, and the protesters who began taking to the streets last summer posted pictures of Khalid Saeed before and after. And they had protests all through the fall and the winter, but it was right after the Tunisian uprising that they were planning to hold another one, and it galvanized, encouraged by what had happened with the Tunisians. They tapped into the Khalid Said movement and produced what was the uprising in Egypt. Um, this is Hamza al-Khatib, a young Syrian 13-year-old, who was separated from his family uh, during a protest in Dara, the, uh, or about Dara, um, the city where the uprising began in Syria. Uh, the, the, he was separated from his parents in April. A month later, his body was returned to his parents, and this is another grisly, grisly picture, with three guns, gunshot wounds, his body covered with cigarette burns, and his genitals had been cut off. The, the, the pictures circulated on, in the media, proving rumors of what happened 
violence to dissidents. And rather than discouraging them, it actually inflamed wider protests. And that's really, since this happened, where Hama has taken off in a much bigger way, and Syria has become, in many ways, the biggest front line for the uprisings. Um, Hamza became the symbol of uh, the Syrian rebellion, in part because he was just one of hundreds of kids, 13, 14 years old, um, who have been arrested, imprisoned, tortured, just for engaging in civil disobedience. Now, the other part of my book, I write about the culture of change. And I think in many ways, this is as important as the uh, wave of political change in defining where the region is going and why it's happening. This is El General, who was a young Tunisian rapper, <clears throat> 21 years old. Hip hop was banned in Tunisia. Uh, so he recorded last November with two of his friends a very raw video, and he posted it on Facebook, then made it to YouTube. And it was very critical uh, in condemning, these are some of the words, condemning President Ben Ali. And he was more public in calling out the regime than any of Tunisia's politicians who dared not criticize a man in power almost a quarter century. Uh, and it was in that context that Bouazizi had his confrontation with the inspector. So when we talk about you know, political change, it has to come in the wider culture of change. Um, DAM is a young Palestinian group they li uh, that lives in a uh, lot outside of Tel Aviv. And uh, they are providing, through rap, an alternative to Molotov cocktails and rockets and suicide bombs when it comes to uh, dealing with their anger. Uh, they're very specific, and they are critical of Israel, and yet they also condemn violence. And that is um, an improvement, if not exactly what uh, the Israelis want. It is something that is at least the first renunciation in a popular medium of violence, particularly for this young generation. There are lots of other groups. This is a young rapper I, I uh, interviewed in Saudi Arabia, of all places, in a place where music you know, is limited uh, and dancing, it can only be sword dances among men. Um, this is a, the Arabian Nights or an Egyptian group. Um, Iran's kiosk is one of the most popular groups in the region. Uh, in, in Iran's disputed 2009 presidential election, an opposition candidate who was a septuagen, septuagen, septuagenarian cleric actually distributed thousands of CDs with rap music messages about democracy as his way of getting young votes. Uh, the medium and the message is changing across the region. These um, are some of the lyrics from Kiosk. And again, boldly challenging the regime uh, in Tehran. Uh, it extends well beyond the Middle East. This is Canaan, who has become the voice of for stability and against extremism in Somalia. Um, some of them have very interesting names. This is Mecca to Medina. Uh, one of my other favorites is a young female rapper called Ms. Understood. Uh, now, the Mecca to Medina underscores uh, an important thing about, uh, quality about the counter jihad. We shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that the embrace of Western idioms like hip hop um, means that the opposition movements want to imitate the West. The counter jihad is uh, both about greater political openings and I think at the end of the day, a greater desire, at least short term, for something that is culturally and in religion familiar, not extremist, but a different kind of Islamic identity. Another trend I write about in the book is what I call the pink hijab. The days of black are over, uh, except in some of the conservative Gulf countries. Uh, this is a young woman in Egypt. And one of the things you see women doing is expressing themselves in ways. And this, again, is they want to be fashionable. They want to be 21st century, but they also want to be very much um, uh, Muslim in their public identities. 
Uh, Dahlia Ziada is one of the women I write about in my book, again, another pink hijabi, uh, who has been very active and in understanding the dynamics of where these people have come from. She is a young woman who became active from the age of eight when her mother told her to put on a party dress and to go uh, because they were going for a special celebration. And she was taken to be circumcised. And she became so angry about this that she, be she campaigned within her family, her father and her uncles, not to do this to her sister and cousins. And she failed time and time again until the last cousin. And she stayed up all night with her uncle and said to him, you know, if you do this to her, I'm going to cut off her finger. And he said, why would you do that to her? That will affect her for the rest of her life. And she said, duh. And at the end of the day, she prevailed. And she decided that if she could change one person's life, maybe she could change others. And she has since gone on to uh, organize. Uh, she, she translated Martin Luther King's uh, comic book about Martin Luther King's walk to freedom uh, into Arabic. And it has lessons in the back about civil disobedience. And she distributed it uh, in many parts of the Arab world. She also launched the first Arab uh, human rights film festival, uh, and this all before the age of 27. Again, this sense of transition, of people putting hijab back on. Hanan Turk is one of Egypt's most famous uh, actresses, famous for her décolletage and her risque film roles, who put the, sh um, uh, the hijab back on. Forty years ago, very few women wore hijab in Egypt. Today, over 80 percent do. But this does not mean that they are, are supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in fact, Dahlia is openly critical of the Muslim Brotherhood. And she says any group that wants to prevent a woman from becoming president or to ostracize Christians from the political system uh, is not for me. Uh, the, the, thing about fashion, I can't resist. This is one of the I, a picture I got from one of the uh, young Egyptian women who was telling me how you tie the hijab now, that women are, this is the so-called Spanish wrap, which is modeled on the flamingo dancer with the, with the bun. Um, another one of the trends I write about is the 99, who are the new comic book superheroes. Uh, the Counter Jihad is also about creating new role models, not just reactive rejection of extremism, but proactively trying to create uh, new models, particularly for this, uh, the overwhelming baby boom in the region. This series was produced by a young Kuwaiti um, psychologist who wanted an alternative to extremists for his five young sons. Um, he created 99 characters, half male, half female, half in hijab, half uh, not wearing hijab. Um, some are quite exotic females. Uh, others are traditionalists. Each of the 99 characters reflects one of God's 99 uh, strengths, wisdoms, or traits. And each one of them uses them to do good. The nemesis, of course, is a character named Abu Ugal who uh, epitomizes bin Laden, who is trying to uh, absorb or usurp all of the powers that the 99 young superheroes have. Um, another thing that, that I write about is the new Muslim comedians and uh, the very entertaining groups, uh, many of them who have started in the West. They, are, they came here as, um, uh, as students or as uh, with their parents. Uh, have assimilated in, into this culture and have turned to comedy often, it was fascinating, the ones I went to see, male and female, all of them told me this hauntingly similar story of their reaction to 9-11, that some who'd been comedians on other subjects, some who had, uh, were just trying to figure out how to, to develop a voice and what idiom, and they turned to comedy as their way and they ridicule um, terrorists. Can I borrow the book? I want to just... Um, there's one joke that is so funny. It's very off color, and my apologies um, uh, to anyone, but it's too, it's, it's too good not to tell. It's told by Maz Jobrani, who's an Iranian-born uh, cleric. Um, uh, and he tells it. 
You know, he says, one guy can really mess it up for all the rest of us. Look at the Christmas bomber, the guy who tried to blow up North, the Northwest flight from Amsterdam to Detroit, this Abu, Abu, Boo, Boo, Mustafa, Hoo, Hoo, or whatever ever his name is. I say this guy's crazy. Come on, any man would back me up. After all, where was the bomb? Yeah, in his underwear. I mean, really, any normal man would question that instruction. Switching to a Middle East accent, Jobrani assumes the role of a normal hijacker in his final discussion with his terrorism masters. Uh, excuse me, I have one, uh, one last question for you. You say my reward in heaven will be 72 virgins. So do you think maybe we could put the bomb someplace else? <laughs> I mean, I really think I'm going to need my penis. You know, not the kind of humor uh, one would anticipate. Uh, All that made me funny is um, a, another one of the comedy troops is the Axis of Evil comedy tour. So the counter jihad can literally be quite funny. Um, they have had an impact. Maz Jabrani and others have taken their humor back to the Middle East. It's been fascinating to watch over the past four or five years as they start having comedy clubs, comedy instructions in the region. Um, uh, Bassam Youssef is the new John Stewart of Egypt, and he had some wonderful uh, shows during the uprising, one in which he did a skit about uh, a, an Egyptian actress complaining that she couldn't get pizza delivered because of the political chaos. Um, <coughs> one of the final things I want to talk about is the use of, of <laughs> literature. Um, at some of my favorite uh, stories in the book are about playwrights who have each taken the word jihad and tried to, give, to, to rescue its meaning to what it originally was. Uh, Yusuf El uh, Gwindi, who's a wonderful Egyptian, uh, wrote Jihad Jones and the Kalashnikov Babes. And I read the, the, um, the script for it uh, on the quiet car from New York to Washington. And I was laughing so loud, people were giving me dirty looks. Uh, it is a raucous comedy, and uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, another one is Tell Jihad Do Us Part which, believe it or not, is a romantic comedy. Uh, and the female protagonist is uh, modeled on Bridget Jones. Uh, uh, it's written by an Indian Muslim. And uh, it's about, again, the kind of challenges of daily life, how to be a good spouse, how to, ha how to have a good marriage, how to lead um, a decent life. The third one is a documentary called A Jihad for Love. And this, again, was done by another Muslim, uh, Indian Muslim. And it's a documentary where she goes to some of the toughest, uh, most rigid Islamic societies in Iran and Saudi Arabia. And he talks to people who want to remain loyal to their faith, practicing and observant, but who also are gay and lesbian. And it's a very moving documentary. But in each case, each one of these um, writers, filmmakers, documentarians has tried to, to use the word jihad deliberately to take it back from the extremists. This is what the counter jihad is all about. Now, um, before closing, I, I wanted to share, people always ask me, how do you know? You know and I, I don't know. I've, I've been covering the region since I landed there on October 6, 1973, the day the war broke out. And um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lifetime of experience. But there was a survey put out yesterday, and I got permission to share some of the slides with you. It's from Tunisia, and it tells some very interesting trends um, on the issue of are we headed to a theocracy or um, a democracy in the region. This is uh, all again in Tunisia. The number of people who are excited about voting and who intend to participate, even though all of these countries face huge obstacles and disillusionment, is growing. 86% still say, as of yesterday, they plan to vote. The interesting thing is that it, it's all up for grabs. 72% in Tunisia don't know who they're voting for. And all this hysteria about Islamists, and not a which is way down at the bottom, is the largest, it's kind of Muslim Brotherhood, although it's much more 
moderate than the Brotherhood. In Tunisia, 7%. The leader is Rashid Ghanoushi, uh, 2%. So this is very telling. Uh, this one is, again, what, do you, what, what kind of system do you want? Uh, secular or um, uh, not? 54% want a secular system. 40% um, disapprove, but the fact that that's something that people react to in defining with a specific definition of secular. Uh, would you prefer to see more political parties or entities that are Islamist or secular? Now this is again what I talk about, that the counter jihad, the next decade is going to be both Islamic and democratic, in that people who have just said they want a secular system um, are also saying they want basically 84% uh, to be Islamist in some way. Some, and that doesn't necessarily mean like Iran's theocrats or you know, Sharia is the only rule of law, but it does mean that this is their political comfort zone. Um, uh, do you, why do you approve of a secular government? And again, uh, or disapprove, and it, again, one out of four says basically Islam has the solution for everything, but it's, um, it's, it has to do with corruption. Uh, it has to do with discipline, um, you know, being tainted by the West. When you look through it, it's quite interesting why they say that. Why do you approve of secular government? Um, almost 50%, almost half, say this is a way for uh, freedom, democracy, and equality. So again, these are the two halves, and this is statistical backup. Um, and the final slide is on women, and I find this really interesting, that in, when told that the discussion is about 50% of women being given uh, a quota for the National Assembly, 53% um, say that's too much, but 41% say that's fine. Now, Tunisia does have the most open women's rights, although it's skewed by, you know, the regime. You had to be friendly to the regime before. This is kind of an open political system. Um, I'm not sure we'd get 41% in the United States saying that. So I find it rather encouraging. Um, so to close, let me just say that, that I think the next day, decade is going to be a time of really unprecedented transformation um, as a new generation emerges to further redefine politics, society, and culture. Um, it will arguably face the tougher, far greater challenges over the next decade than they've faced over the past decade. We've got to remember that. The, uh, a lot of it is about the economy, stupid. The, the challenges that they face in every single country, not one of them can afford democracy. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. I've talked too long. I promised Holly I'd keep it down. but but. Um, my last one is uh, a slide from never under underestimate people power. Um, we are only at the beginning of the beginning. Uh, I often remind people that a generation after the Soviet Union's demise, we still have a former communist and KGB chief in power in Moscow. And in South Africa, where um, I spent a good bit of time, the majority of blacks are worse off economically uh, than they were under apartheid, and that's tough. Uh, it's a generation after Nelson Mandela walked to freedom. That change takes a long time. Uh, it takes resources that most of these countries don't have. And uh, it's going to be really hard for us to determine how to be most helpful as well. So I thank you for that and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, we have a large overflow on the sixth floor, so I'm going to take questions from this room and also from the overflow. Uh, Robin, let me ask you the first question. When did you come across this counter jihad? You know, I what went. What were the no. symptoms? When did you? you was it during your travels or talking to different young people or? I mean, how did you come across it? Uh, it's a word I came up with. No one gave it to me, so I take you know, yeah. full blame. Uh, but I went out to the region to, look, to write a book originally about what had happened in the Islamic world in the decades since 9-11. And the idea was to put it out uh, in September 
of this year. And I kept tripping over people everywhere I went who were galvanized, who were doing things, who were, again, being proactive for the first time. That's what struck me. When you look at, in many ways, this is what I call the fourth phase of the Islamic revival. In the 70s, you saw the emergence of political Islam. Uh, first in the aftermath of the 73 war when the Arabs lost so d disastrously and began turning to Islam and it exploded with the 79 Iranian revolution. In the 1980s, I lived in Beirut as did David Ottaway, um, uh, during the first suicide bombs. I'll sti I can still hear in my head the bomb at the Marine compound in October 1983 that's the largest loss of U.S. military life in a single incident since Iwo Jima, the largest non-nuclear explosion to this day anywhere on earth. And uh, we saw it begin with um, Shiites, for whom martyrdom is a central tenet, and expand by the end of the 80s to the Sunnis, particularly among the Palestinians, for, for whom martyrdom is not as, uh, uh, as central a tenet. In the 1990s, we saw the great experiment as groups like Hezbollah emerged from the underground and and you saw this transition from the bullet to the ballot, or in most cases, a combination of both. And there was a, it was very striking that whether it was the Brotherhood beginning to run openly, ISLA, the reform, Islamic Reform Party in Yemen, um, the Islamic parties in Kuwait, that, that in virtually every country, the emergence of uh, justice and development in, in Morocco, in virtually every country you saw Islam in politics and you saw the transition of militants to try to participate in some way in the system legitimately. In the past, but all of those three trends were reactive to whether it was the Arab-Israeli conflict, the presence of you know, Western troops, um, that it was reactive to the um, autocracies. What's so striking about what's happening today is it's the first, this fourth phase of the Islamic revival is the first where people have tried to be proactive and to seize the initiative. And, and one of the important messages for us as we watch this happen is uh, I, it, this is not your, you know, you in the West. You, we may like your ideas, we may like, we may use some of your, your idioms, but this is our moment and we will define it. And it is going to be very important for us to listen and not try to be too heavy-handed um, as they make a lot of their own mistakes and they'll have to learn for themselves. We'll want to go in and say, we know how to do it, we'll help you. And we mean it genuinely. Um, let me now give the floor to uh, Jane Harmon, the President CEO and Director of the Wilson Center. Um, no, hello to everyone, and congratulations to Robin on a spectacular book. I was reading it on the airplane the other day, and all the people around me wanted copies. Uh, so you should know this is going to be a bestseller. It's going to make the Wilson Center rich. Um, <laughs> Uh, we scholars like Robin, I mean, uh, you know, wise persons like Robin are, are why the Wilson Center is as well known as we are, and it has just been a pleasure uh, to work so closely with you now, uh, to work so closely with someone I've known well over the years. I just wanted to mention that we have been joined at this, uh, um, I guess this is a conversation, uh, by Ann Patterson, who has just been confirmed by the Senate as our new ambassador to Egypt. She will be leaving in a couple of weeks. And she is welcome to defend herself, but I would like you all to know that I, I uh, met her and uh, spent a lot of time with her in her last gig as ambassador to a very easy and non-controversial country called Pakistan. Uh, after that, um, uh, four years, I guess, four, of, of an unaccompanied post. Her husband, David, uh, had to stay here uh, and received for the second time the award as the best career ambassador. Uh, so I, I, I really can't say enough about her. And do you want to say anything at all? No, she doesn't. But we're just going to come and listen to all of you uh, ask good questions to uh, Robin. And again, 
Hala, who runs our Middle East program here, uh, sets the gold standard for uh, uh, what we should be doing here. And this crowd, Hala, has a lot to do with Robin, but it also has a lot to do with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, may I just take the first question from the uh, overflow, because we have a huge crowd there. Robin, um, I'm going to sort of give you a short question, short answer, because we Speak are in the mic. out of Ah, sorry. Microphone. Uh, oh, okay. Um, in the context of this counter jihad culture, what effect would the Muslim Brotherhood have on the culture if elected to power in Egypt? One of the most interesting things happening in the region is the, the emergence of a real Islamic spectrum among themselves, besides the wider, uh, you know, the diversity of parties that, have, that are slowly trying to emerge. You know, I've never feared the, the Brotherhood. I have to say that up front. Um, they renounced violence in the 1970s. I don't happen to agree with their uh, agenda, their manifesto uh, at all, but I, I don't worry about them as ever in the you know, really near future um, overwhelming the political system or trying to create a theocracy in Egypt. I think one of the most interesting trends, in fact, is the fracturing of the Muslim Brotherhood into some say four, some say five different factions. There are those, particularly among the young, who have broken off um, because they oppose uh, the restrictions on um, women or Christians running for the presidency. They also think, even more importantly, that the Muslim Brotherhood reflects an autocratic system, that it elects its supreme leader basically, or selects, not elects, uh, its supreme leader for life, and that there's a lot of friction, and I think that the uprisings are going to redefine the um, Islamist uh, agenda as well. The people who concern me more are the Salafis who are funded by Saudi Arabia, who um, often are, have been associated with militant agendas. They've given up violence, but their agenda, their idea is the same. And I think those are quietly trying to creep into, a, into the political system, um, promising order out of the, you know, particularly at a, which may be attractive at a time of growing kind of disorder. Uh, and, and that those are the ones we need to be worried about, less the old established groups like Ennahda in Tunisia. Uh, or the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, yes, please just wait for the mic. Thank you. My question, uh, uh, my name is Stephen Shore. I thought you had given a wonderful presentation, but to me it's essentially you're describing a tsunami after the fact. And I cannot help but ask you, did you have any foreboding that something of this magnitude would, hap would occur be before it happened? I do, and actually I'm vindicated. The Stimson Center did a report and identified, looked at, it's kind of an, it's an interesting report, which I recommend, um, not just because it mentions me, but uh, it looks at academics, uh, the intelligence community, um, think tanks, and journalists, and who got it and who didn't. I wrote a book three years ago in which I talked about the YouTube generation, I talked about the growing role um, uh, of the young, of women, uh, and so forth. And one of the things that was striking was the kids I had gone out to talk to that are, were already characters in my book during the, um, uh, the uprising in Egypt would tweet me, you know, or text me, or call me on their cell phones and say, oh, we've got 10,000 a day, or we're gonna start ca camping out tonight, you know, that, that uh, this is not an after effect. I've been doing, I've been working on this book for two years and to try to, to figure out, and um, no one knew the flashpoint, the specific flashpoint, but it was clear that this was coming. Uh, the Wilson Center published a, um, had a publication by David Otterway two years ago called Egypt at the Tipping Point, yeah. and uh, you know, so even we we saw what might be happening. Uh, I did. I did actually a five-page spread in Time yes. Magazine called the Soft Revolution two years ago, um, writing about some of the people who ended up active in in the uprising. Uh, yes, the lady. The, uh, just a few. The mic is coming. Please, can I ask you for giving us very brief questions? We are running out of time. Sure. My name is Saba Ahmed, and I wanted to find out, um, uh, just as a young Muslim who's grown up in America, uh, there is 
I feel like the tipping point is coming here to the Washington DC as well. Muslims are really fed up <laughs> of like what's going on around our, the world. And I think just even with the budget situation here, focusing on military to fight Islamist terrorists and stuff, I feel, feel like why aren't we engaging the Muslims in this discussion in terms of advocating for policy? Because all Muslims believe in one Quran, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, as Muslims, we're supposed to be all brothers and sisters in Islam. So uh, I feel like targeting specific groups is not the right way. So I just want to hear your comments on that. Thank you. I'm not sure what the question is. I don't make policy. Um, I uh, admire people like Ann Patterson enormously, and I also don't envy her. <laughs> uh, a question from the overthrow, Robin. Uh, what lessons do you think can be learned in the Arab Spring countries from the monarchies? And <laughs> All right, two okay. points, and I feel very strongly about this. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop using the term Arab Spring. There was no Arab Spring. It, hap it began in December, and every single uprising, every ouster and every uprising began before March 21st. It happened in the winter. And we discredit, the, we, this whole seasonal thing is very catchy, but it is, some historian or someone is going to write that this is unfair to the ideas, to the momentum. No place else in the world have you seen a, a man who's been in power for 30 years ousted in 18 days. You can't, you know, this is a, uh, it drives me crazy, all this stuff about Arab Spring, long, hot summer, cold winters, you know, and so forth. It's just, we, we've got to move on uh, on that. In terms of the monarchy, I think the great challenge the United States faces and the great hypocrisy and inconsistency in our policy is we say, well, you know, every country is different. Well, of course they are. But we had one principle for Eastern Europe in def you know, at the time of uh, communism. And we should have the same common values when we uh, um, evaluate what we're going to do in uh, whether it's in the Gulf or in North Africa. And yes, the patterns, the pace, the culture, and so forth, they're changing. And maybe things won't happen as quickly. But we're also, just as we have been criticized, why did we go into Iraq? You know, the, the perception, even though it wasn't true, was that we were there in part because of oil. The same thing is happening now when it comes to how far are we willing to go with Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and the other sheikdoms in pushing them. And the reality is we're not doing very much. We may be saying some things in the background. Uh, we're willing to do more in Yemen, but Yemen, you know, <laughs> is Yemen. Uh, and, and so I think that we're really, we're really vulnerable when it comes to these monarchies. And to say that there are lessons in the monarchies, I, I don't think there are. I think that we're going to pay a price down the road for having not done more. Uh, when you look at Saudi Arabia, the average age is in the middle 20s of the majority of, of its people. The average age of the cabinet minister is 65, and the average age of or the king is 87, and the next two in line are in the early 80s and late 70s. We're not talking a generation gap. We're talking two and three generation gaps. They're just out of sync. And, um, and the illusion that, you know, that because there's no Tahrir Square in Saudi Arabia doesn't mean that there's not unhappiness, whether it's over unemployment, which is a big problem, uh, whether it's over access to education, um, housing, and so forth. Uh, you know, I just think we, we give in too easy in this argument about the differences among countries. Yes. Hi, uh, Shirin from uh, Radio Sawa. Well, my first quick question to you is, do you speak Arabic? And the second question is that, um, you know, for all these decades uh, that you spoke about, the West had actually backed most of these dictators. Um, do you think now, in a way or another, that the West also changed because the West is now backing the revolutions? Thank you. That the West is uh, backing the revolution? Uh, back the revolution. I think there were 11 days in February where I think the United States, and I write about this in my last chapter on U.S. policy, did a dramatic 180-degree turn. And, and I actually captured the moment that uh, President Obama went to the microphone on day one and went back on day 11. And it, it's quite striking, but it was very limited. And uh, our policy still has to evolve a good way. We're only part of the way there. We were willing, in part because we had to embrace and accept what was happening on the street. We had few alternatives, but we didn't try to back away. In other words, we're partly responsible and we partly had little alternative. Uh, 
as I said before, we have a long way to go. Uh, on Arabic, Wahanin Kladi Hamza said Saba. When I lived in Beirut for five years, I spoke a good bit of conversational Arabic, but I can't read it. Uh, Robin, along the same line from the overflow, any general trends among the reform movements and their views towards Israel? You know, I, one of the interesting things is I think Israel has not been so far a major component in the uprisings. Um, the danger is I'm worried that the that you know things will are so flatlined now that the Israelis may end up getting sucked into it in some way, blamed whether it's um, you know over pipeline issues or um, Gaza, the, there are just a lot of ways that the Arab-Israeli conflict could become part of the, the narrative, part of the rhetoric, part of the platforms, um, an issue in elections. Uh, after all, when it comes to telling people what you believe in, you're going to have to tell them what you want in foreign policy as well as domestic policy. And that's where I think uh, we could you know, find a turning point, because once you define it, uh, you're stuck with it. And it's really hard to back away, as we've discovered over the years with a lot of groups. Um, so, you know, if I were the Prime Minister of Israel, and I'm not, um, I would be doing a lot more, a lot faster, uh, to take advantage of this moment and not get caught out even more down the road. Um, the lady there, and the, yes. Uh, very brief question. Um, could you speak a bit about the Turkic world, the, a the positive or po positively or potentially positive view of the AKP or influence of the AKP in Turkey, and also whether and how long Central Asia will be immune from the uh, counter? Uh, Central Asia. I actually did a piece for the New Yorker. I went to Central Asia as it was, uh, as the Soviet Union was collapsing in 1991. And uh, I remember the editor, uh, obviously before David Remnick, uh, said to me, where do you want to go? You know, and I talked about Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and so forth. And I did a whole, it was really interesting to me how during 70 years of communism that Islam had remained as a really important source of identity. And this is what I say. Often, when you look at political transitions, uh, it's like a tornado. People, uh, what happens in a tornado, you cling to the pillars of identity. And it's the same thing in a political tornado. You cling to the pillars of your identity, and Islam is one of them. And, and what happens is when the tornado passes, you come up and rebuild. Um, and and this is we're going through a tornado, and we have to realize that if people cling to the pillars of their identity, it's common to every religion in the world. Um, it, it, I lived in South Africa and saw when Nelson Mandela was arrested, Des, um, you know, Desmond Tutu was, the Archbishop of Cape Town became the face of the anti-apartheid movement, whether it's the Dalai Lama in Tibet, liberation theology in Latin America, the Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union, that religion has always been a way of kind of guiding people. And, and you know, because solidarity was backed by the church didn't mean that Catholicism, that, you know, Poland was going to become a Catholic theocracy. Um, in terms of the AKP, the, um, uh, justice and development in, in Turkey, you know, look, it's got, its, it's got many flaws, but it is also proven that it is willing to work in a democratic system. And most importantly, it did more than any of the secular pro-Western parties in bringing Turkey up to par on international, you know, to become a member of, of the European community on IMF reforms, um, in creating industry and jobs, um, economic productivity, and, and is, uh, it has been, um, it is, when it comes to harassment of the press, it doesn't like criticism, its leadership has real ego problems. Um, uh, but Turkey is in many ways a model, and it's been very interesting to see how the Arabs, who once loathed the Turks because of the Ottoman experience, now look at the Turkey's experience, not necessarily as a model, exact model for them, but as a way of saying, you know, how do you blend these two trends that I talked about? Um, last question, please. Yes, but very brief. We just are maybe 30 seconds more left. Thank you. Benjamin Tua. 
Uh, you've uh, referred to the possible involvement of the Israeli issue uh, in the foreign, in the uh, electoral campaigns in uh, the various Arab countries, but how do you see the emphasis on nonviolent resistance playing out in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, between themselves? I actually, and Robin, sorry, there is a similar question from the overflow. It says, how would you compare uh, these movements to other nonviolent movement that have uh, taken place over the past 60 years. So, uh, I actually write about the Palestinian um, civil disobedience campaign, and I think it's really interesting. Um, there's one town along the wall which every week has held demonstrations uh, in protest because the, the town was lost some of its agricultural land and split up and so forth. And it's fascinating to me to watch uh, they dress up every week in a different costume. One week they put on Santa Claus costumes, and one week they put on, they all dress themselves in blue with pointy tails in the characters, the Navi people from Avatar, the movie. Um, that they, that they're, every week it's a different thing. Um, Martin Luther King the third went out and, and went to the, the town and talked to them, as did um, uh, one of Gandhi's, I think, grandchildren or some, great-grandchildren or something. Yeah. Anyway, that there, that that the, you see, having covered the, I lived in Beirut when the PLO was, you know, the biggest terrorist group in the Middle East and maybe the world, and um, and I covered the intifadas and so forth. And it's so striking to me that the, the Palestinians, the ma vast majority of them, every poll indicates, including two new polls in the last three months, one by an Israeli group and one by a Palestinian group, that they are. They, they were, don't think violence is going to provide them with the answers, and that they back either negotiations or civil disobedience. Uh, when you look at what's their big political hot ticket now, it's going to the United Nations. Um, you know, that's a far cry from the days that they were hijacking aircraft and, um, you know, fighting the Israelis along the border. It's just a different. Uh, the Palestinians are part of the phenomena. I am not beginning to say that the militant movements are over. But I think they're increasingly passe. And when you talk to people about what they want, it's a laptop, not a rifle or, or a, you know, a hand grenade. Um, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, the rest of your questions is answered in the yes. book. <laughs> <laughs> and I strongly recommend that you get the book. And um, I would like to thank the people who were in the overflow and just uh, to remind you that on the 19th, we are having a meeting on, forgive me, Robin, we called it the Arab Spring and the United States. But, but our next publication, which you will see within the next three weeks, is called Saudi Arabia in the Shadow of Arab Revolt. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Join you very me. much. <laughs>